good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us um, for today's uh, webinar around the intersection of transphobia and sexual violence. We certainly appreciate that you have decided to join us on this important topic. Um, great, and um, this is Victoria Riekers, the Sexual Violence Response Coordinator, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And this is Jason Vale Cruz, the Sexual Violence Public Policy Coordinator, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and if you could all um, type in your name, um, your pronouns, and the organization or agency that you're with uh, in the chat box, so that way we know um, everything is working. That's wonderful. Thank you all so much. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, but if you have any questions throughout um, throughout the webinar, there's a Q and A um, uh, button, and you can press that, and we'll receive your questions. Um, and yeah, um, great. Um, so first of all, I just want to go through the aims of today. So today we're going to review a brief 101 about the transgender community. Uh, we're also going to discuss a definition of transphobia as well as its cultural origins. Uh, we'll provide a definition of sexual violence and the ways that transphobia increases its risk. Um, and we'll also share a definition of allyship and how allies can, di can dismiss, uh, can diminish uh, risk by challenging transphobia. And so to start, we're going to talk a little bit about the transgender community. We know that the transgender community is part of the broader LGBTQ community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, and queer community. And we know that there is often a lot of focus on the transgender community, as it recently they have uh, begun to assert their, their uh, human rights and um, been focused on a lot by people that have uh, other beliefs about them. And we're gonna discuss some of those beliefs and how they are based in culture. Uh, we will start by just kind of taking a look at some of the folks that are part of the transgender community. Can anyone in the, in the web chat identify any of the folks that are in this, uh, in this slide? Please go ahead, Michael. Thank you. If you could identify one of one of the pictures. Oh, great. So we have Laverne Cox uh, and Marsha P. Johnson, and they are the bottom uh, the bottom two uh, on the left hand side, kind of the center and the left hand side of the screen. Um, we have Chaz Bono, which is at the top, kind of middle of the screen. Laverne Cox at the top right of the screen. Jazz from I Am Jazz, who is pictured with her mother at the top of the screen. And for those that don't recognize some of the others, we in, in the bottom middle, we have Sylvia Ray Rivera, who along with Marsha P. Johnson was instrumental in the Stonewall riots, which is a kind of um, big leap in the LGBTQ rights movement. We have Zeke Smith on the bottom right-hand corner of the, the screen. He was a, uh, a contestant on the game show Survivor. And then at the top left of the screen, we have Lace Ashley, who is a male model. Um, and kind of beneath um, Lace and Jazz is Alok Vaid Mennon, who's a non-binary activist um, and advocate uh, throughout the nation. 
So as you can see, there are many folks uh, that are important and in, in many facets of our culture that are part of the transgender community going back through our history and up through current today. Um, so what actually determines gender? Um, so in our society, we know that many people feel like there are only two genders, male or female, um, and that these genders are based on body parts. Uh, so what kind of genitalia and chromosomes someone might have? Uh, but this can actually, this thinking can actually create a lot of problems. Um, as someone, um, sometimes people might lose um, different body parts or are not born with certain body parts but they will identify with the gender um, that those body parts are not associated with. And it also discounts intersex people. So um, these are folks who may have genitalia or chromosomes that are associated with both male and female bodies. Um, so if gender followed this biology that certain genitalia uh, and certain chromosomes determined um, what the gender is, we would have multiple genders because there's multiple um, different uh, formations that intersex uh, people um, have. So instead, gender is actually determined by how someone feels about themselves and how they in identify internally. So with the current system of gender assignment, uh, we know that uh, when children are born, a doctor diagnoses uh, the gender of the child. The doctor basically declares if a baby is a boy or girl based on social constructs about the body, so whether the baby has a penis or a vagina. And then when the baby's genitalia is unclear, uh, because they might be intersex, uh, the doctor actually makes the decision if the child is going to be diagnosed male or female, and they sometimes perform surgery to make the baby's body conform um, to social norms of male or female. Uh, and this surgery can be very damaging for infants, um, and it's actually illegal in, most, uh, in many countries, but not in the U.S. And obviously, at this age, uh, when a child's an infant, they're too young to give any input on this, um, and they may be misdiagnosed as male or female as a result. Um, and it's actually the reaction of the child later in life that determines uh, how they are identified um, and how they personally identify. As children age, they become aware of gender and gender roles, and they also understand what it means to be a boy and what it means to be a girl in our society, and then they can decide if they want to be either both or neither. And so if this diagnosis of gender is wrong, uh, the person might describe themselves as transgender. So this is when someone identifies with a gender different from the one they were assigned at birth. And then for all those uh, whose gender diagnosis is correct, um, they were described as cisgender. So that's when um, you identify with the sex that you are assigned at birth. Um, and so then this picture here is from the comic uh, Assigned Male, um, and she writes, being trans doesn't mean that I was born a different gender. It means I was mistaken for a different gender at birth than the one I am. So that puts it really nicely. All right, so what is the transgender community? So uh, transgender is used commonly as an umbrella term for, a multi uh, for multiple different identities um, of folks who don't necessarily align uh, with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, not all people uh, who identify um, under this umbrella use the word trans. So some folks who are non-binary uh, might not identify with the word trans. Some folks who are non-binary might identify with uh, the word trans. Um, and so speaking of non-binary, what, what does that mean? Um, so some folks identify with binary genders, like man or woman. Um, so you see trans man or trans woman under this umbrella. And then some identify with non-binary genders. So it means outside of the bind binary, so that not necessarily with man or with woman. Uh, it could be a combination of identity, identifying with man or woman. It could be identifying as neither uh, man or woman, or it could be uh, kind of fluid and sometimes identifying uh, with man and sometimes identifying with woman. Um, you'll also notice that intersex is under this umbrella. Again, some people who are intersex um, identify um, under the trans umbrella and some people who are intersex do not identify under the trans umbrella. All right, so to get into non-binary a little bit more specifically, uh, there are many, uh, many non-binary genders and a few of them are listed on the screen. Um, we're not gonna go through all the genders 
listed here, uh, but it's important to note that um, non-binary folk don't have a determined look um, or appearance, and they might identify differently depending on um, depending on their identity and depending on how they feel. Um, so it's important to talk to someone um, about their identity um, rather than make assumptions what their identity is. Uh, Non-binary folks may also use a variety of pronouns, uh, and we'll discuss this later. Another identity that sometimes people identify as underneath the trans umbrella, but sometimes do not, is two-spirit. And two-spirit is an especially important identity as it's for indigenous First Nations individuals in North America. Uh, it is something that uh, was before colonialism, something that was valued and respected in many communities. Uh, they believed that the um, body was home to both female and male spirits within themselves, hence the English term two spirits, although each tribal community and, and nation had their own language around this and their own um, identity that was associated with it. The difference with two-spirit individuals from a lot of Western transgender um, ideas is that with two-spirit there can be a difference in either gender or in sexual orientation or both and they can identify themselves with uh, as being two-spirit. It's important to note that two-spirit uh, is only to be used with indigenous folks um, and also with all of these identities that we talk about, we should never, as Victoria mentioned, being uh, assume anyone's identity or give the people a label. Instead, we should um, have conversations where people feel comfortable enough to disclose to us what their identity is and then ask them permission on, and guidance on how to use that identity should we need to in service provision. And so, you know, oftentimes this is called Nearing, if that's the permission that you're given. So now that we have a bit of an idea of what different identities exist in the trans community, we're going to talk about um, coming out as transgender and transitioning. Um, so it's really important to note that there are many ways to be transgender and not everyone follows the same path. Um, so what does it mean to transition? Um, so transitioning is the personal process of affirming one's gender and identity. Uh, oftentimes people might go through a period of self-discovery and recognize that their gender does not match with their sex assigned at birth. And this could be at a very young age, um, but this could also occur when someone's older. We live in a world that tells us that children, um, that tells children that people with penises must be boys and people with vagina must be girls. So sometimes it can be really difficult to recognize your gender if it doesn't align with this idea. Uh, when folks realize that they're trans, uh, they may internally come out to themselves and they may internally shift thinking about themselves and about their gender. Um, not everyone comes out beyond coming out to themselves. Um, this is a very personal process. And then uh, when it comes to transitioning, um, there are multiple types of transitioning and not everyone um, chooses to transition importantly, and not everyone chooses to um, go through all, this, all of the uh, ways one can transition. Uh, but some of the um, uh, more known ways to transition are social transitioning. So social transitioning refers to um, social changes in their everyday life. Um, so this could be asking people to call them by a different name or different pronoun. Uh, it could be um, using a bathroom that best aligns with their gender. Um, social transitioning may not happen all at once, so someone may only ask a select group of people to call them by their name, um, and they may not socially transition in other places like the workplace. Um, some people may socially transition in all aspects of their life, and for some people it could be all at once, and for some people it could be a gradual process. Um, legal transitioning um, is another form of transition, and that refers to changing legal documents that better reflect their gender uh, and their name. So this could be changing their legal name and their gender markers on driver's license, passports, social security cards, birth certificates, all of those legal documents that we need um, in our world. And this can be a really cumbersome process um, and can vary by state. Um, and actually, a, a friend of mine recently spent several months changing their documents and still has some that they weren't able to change after several months. 
Um, and then finally, medical transition is another form of transitioning, and this refers to using surgery or medication um, to change appearance so that um, their appearance is more in line with their gender socially. So some trans folks, um, some trans folks have feelings of uh, gender dysphoria, uh, which refers to feelings of distress uh, when someone's physical body does not align with their gender. Um, and not every person feels the need to surgically or medically transition. Um, and among those who do, physical and medical transition can still look very different. So there's multiple options um, that someone has to medically transition. So someone might use surgical procedures. Um, some, may, some might be very against using surgical procedures. Some might use hormone therapy um, and of different types and amounts. So medically, medical transition um, can also be very costly. Um, and oftentimes, medical transition uh, might not be covered by insurance companies, um, which can be a huge barrier since the cost of uh, medical transitions can be very, very significant. Um, surgery and hormone therapy can also carry health risks and unwanted side effects. So it's very um, understandable that many people might not choose um, to transition medically. Um, and then transitioning also does not have a definitive endpoint. Um, I've heard uh, people um, who are not transgender say that someone might be becoming a particular gender, but this, uh, this phrase is not accurate. A person is always their gender, regardless of the way they look or act and the way that um, cisgender people interpret their gender. And then transitioning is always a very deeply personal choice. So when someone transitions socially, um, like I mentioned before, they may ask um, to use particular pronouns. Um, so pronouns are really important because they stand in for our name. Um, and so it's a sign of respect to make sure we're always using the pronouns that someone asks us to use, rather than what we assume they are. Um, so some of the pronouns that people might use are she um, and, he, and he. So these are the binary pronouns um, that we uh, typically associate with male or female. But there's also other uh, pronouns out there. So they, uh, they, them, theirs uh, is a common gender neutral pronoun um, that folks might use. Um, and then the, their, theirs or um, her, hers is also a, a gender neutral pronoun um, that folks might use. And also it's important to keep in mind that using incorrect pronouns and names can be very traumatic for trans folks. So it's very important that we always respect um, people's names and pronouns. Some other important points um, are that not all trans individuals follow the same path to fully embracing their identity. Um, if people say they are transgender, we should always believe them. Um, and no one has to conform to any specific standard of beauty to look or uh, to look or to deserve respect. Just as kind of a reiteration, uh, as Victoria has said that um, people are who they are and we should be respectful of them and treat them appropriately. This means that we should also make sure that we're using person first language and avoiding common errors that are disrespectful and can be traumatic. So for example, we should not use transgenders as though it is a plural. We should say someone is a transgender person or a person of trans uh, experience. We shouldn't say a transgender as though it was a noun or transgendered as though it was something that happened to somebody. It, it is a transgender person uh, again or a trans man, a trans woman, a non-binary individual. Um, something that, um, you know, demonstrates respect for them. Additionally, some old erroneous understandings of transgender experience, meaning that they, that people say that it was a woman trapped in a man's body or that people are becoming female or becoming male, is simply incorrect. Uh, trans women were always women. Trans men were always men. Uh, even if it took them time to disclose that to you or to understand that themselves, and we should be respectful of, of them um, based on that and believe them when they tell us that that is who they are. Again, just to reiterate on pronouns as well, pronouns stand in for who you are as a person. They stand in for your name and your name is, is um, very powerful and significant to your identity. And so you should always be asking someone's pronouns and respectful, similarly to the way that we opened uh, the presentation today by saying, 
Hi, my name is Jason. My pronouns are he, him, his. What's your name and what pronouns should I use for you? For those of you working in the anti-violence movement, Forge Forward or the organization Forge has great um, uh, trainings and uh, tip sheets on how to be more respectful to survivors that, of transgender experience that may be seeking services. We're next going to talk about the challenge of transphobia and really where the origins of transphobia uh, begin so that we can kind of deconstruct it and begin to uh, stop transphobia, especially in service provision around sexual violence. So when we talk about transphobia, what we're really discussing is cis sexism. And cis sexism is the assumption that being cisgender which we know um, had, had um, previously been described as uh, when someone identifies with the gender that they were assigned at birth is, is really the norm. Um, and that's just not correct. So sexism is similar to many uh, forms of oppression in that it has a misunderstanding um, and, and uses systems within society to to keep that cis sexism going. So cis sexism affects everyone and can be internalized, even if you're a member of the LGBTQ community. Homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia are all byproducts of heterosexism and cis sexism. And then on the screen here, the some women have penises, uh, that statement is, um, uh, going against cis sexism, right? So cis sexism has the assumption that women can't have penises. Uh, but we know that's not true because some women do have penises. So that's like a pretty clear example of cis sexism. We also know that cis sexism manifests in a variety of ways in our society. Uh, most recently in the news, we've heard about a school that had to close because the parents were threatening to harm and potentially kill a transgender child that was attending that school. Uh, some of those parents even um, were saying, I believe it was through a, a public information board, that it was open season on that child. Other manifestations of cis sexism may be within laws where uh, transgender folks are unable to change gender markers on their birth certificates or unable to change gender marker on their state issued driver's licenses. They may, you may also see cis sexism in the way that transgender individuals are portrayed or described in the media, um, oftentimes villainizing them or having them be portrayed strictly by uh, cis sex um, um, actors versus letting transgender performers actually um, fill those roles. And so there's lots of different ways that you can see that manifest in our culture. It's also important to note that trans folks are more than just one side of their identity. This is called intersectionality and it was coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw and can cause multiple levels of complex trauma. It's used to describe the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group uh, regarding as creating overlapping and interdependent dependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Um, and so you'll see this, particularly with the transgender community, in terms of rates of violence against trans women of culture. So not only are they facing um, oppression based on the fact that they're transgender, they're also facing oppression based on the fact that they're women and that they're women of color specifically. Um, and so the, that's one example of intersectionality and how it can play out in a negative way within the transgender community. And we know that there are daily threats to the transgender community um, that, uh, that focus in, in many different communities. So places that are traditionally safe for cis people are not always safe uh, for transgender individuals. And this can be uh, places like schools, uh, doctor's offices, even faith communities. Uh, when transgender people um, attempt to participate and seek services in these different places, they may face anger, they may face violence, 
uh, they may face people shaming them or, or uh, even harming them. Often it results in murder. In fact, a trans woman is killed internationally every 29 hours. Um, trans people face so much violence in their life that one study according to Planet Transgender in 2017 said that trans women of color have a life expectancy of 35 years old. Again, this is just one study, but it is um, it does show uh, about the level of violence that happens. Plus today, with all the anti-transgender propaganda, bathrooms have become especially dangerous. This has health implications as people are delaying going to the bathroom or even not eating at work or school so that they don't have a need of going to the bathroom. Even more insidious, some states are specifically um, legislating against transgender people being able to use the bathroom that corresponds with their identity, creating additional challenges. And this is often based in the false belief that transgender people are perpetrators of sexual violence when it's more often the case that transgender people are targeted by violence when they're seeking services in public spaces. Here in Arizona, uh, there are systemic discrimination that faces the entire LGBTQ community, um, but especially harms the transgender community. So statewide, a person can be fired or denied housing or public accommodations in the state of Arizona based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, or their gender expression. And gender expression is the way that people may uh, show their gender or perform their gender publicly. It could uh, be the clothes that they wear, or how they perform within society. So unless individuals are living in Phoenix, Tucson, Tempe, Flagstaff, or Sedona, where local ordinances are enacted to protect LGBTQ people, there is systemic discrimination that happens to um, this community. In addition, Arizona has a no promo homo law that prohibits youth health education regarding sexuality and sexual health to positively portray the LGBTQ community, which leaves um, the LGBTQ youth and especially transgender youth at a disadvantage because they are not receiving the same level of, of health information, if any. For transgender youth uh, specifically, we know that there are high rates of homelessness, substance use, uh, and, and violence. In fact, youth homelessness has several sources and the homeless rates for LGBTQ youth, including the transgender community, is as high as 40%. This is often because they are forced out of their home or had to leave their home because it's too unsafe to stay. In addition, according to the Nas National Transgender Discrimination Study, family who chose not to speak or spend time with their transgender youth is as high as 57% nationwide. A national survey by GLSEN, the Gay Lesbian Student Educational Network, has found that 75% of transgender youth feel unsafe at school, and those who are able to persevere had significantly lower GPAs, with more, were more likely to miss school out of concern for their safety, and were more likely, and were less likely, rather, to plan on continuing their education. For example, 59% of transgender students have been denied access to restrooms consistent with their gender identity. And so imagine trying to go to school and feeling like you can't go to the bathroom should you need to. Rather than focusing on their education, many of these students struggle for the ability to come to school and be themselves without being punished for wearing clothes or using facilities consistent with who they are. Uh, some are denied opportunities to go on field trips or participate in sports. Uh, this, together with the rampant amount of bullying and, and victim blaming when it comes to sexual violence, these conflicts can lead to a disproportionate amount of dis discipline, student uh, push-out, and involvement with juvenile uh, justice systems. We also should note um, that according to the Trevor Project, 40% of transgender adults have reported made, making a, a previous attempt at suicide. 92% of these individuals reported that they attempted suicide before
before the age of 25. Um, this is actually as startling as these numbers are, is lower than data in previous years. So it looks like there hopefully is the start of a trend of this declining, but just the uh, rampant amount of systemic discrimination that transgender individuals face um, can cause vulnerabilities around suicide. The National Transgender Discrimination Study found that uh, uh, transgender youth were bullied or harassed at school at uh, between a 50 to 54 percent rate. And we know that this doesn't just stop at the classroom, but extends home with social media and cyberbullying. Additionally, Glisten reports that bullying in Arizona is higher than the national average, as Arizona is often, unfortunately, a state that hates. Not only do trans youth have to worry about the bathroom issue in Arizona and the no promo homo law, but, but this level of violence can really uh, significantly impact their future. And then we also know that employment challenges are another manifestation of this sexism. Um, so as Jason mentioned before, in Arizona, there are no employment um, protections under law statewide. There are only protections in city ordinances. And so trans individuals will face unique challenges in the workplace because of this. Um, so according to a national survey, uh, 50 to 59% experience discrimination or harassment at work. Uh, 64 to 65% of trans individuals suffered physical or sexual violence at work. Um, the highest number of respondents indicated that their income level was between 20,000 and 49,999 um, um, per year, leaving, which leaves the door open for economic controls from a partner. And then there are no job protections in Arizona, as I mentioned. Additionally, and, and this comes from an older study um, back in 2009, uh, when transgender individuals go to seek services, 50% of them have to teach their provider how to care for them. Um, and doctors don't necessarily need to know um, specialized care for uh, for, for some things, but there are specific things that doctors may need to know for um, transgender individuals, um, especially regarding um, specific, specific procedures that may not conform with what the doctor perceives as normal for that gender. But additionally, as you can see on the screen, when uh, transgender individuals have sought help at uh, doctors' offices, they may have experienced um, many harmful reactions. And on the right-hand side, you can see the rates of transgender or gender nonconforming folks that were refused needed care, received harsh language, had the doctor refused to touch them, uh, blamed them for their illness, or were physically rough and abusive. And again, this uh, particular study shows that the impact of intersectionality, as you can see, the blue lines, which are people of color, are um, much higher in, in this impact than uh, white transgender uh, people as well. So minority stress, um, it describes this chronically high level of stress faced by members of stigmatized minority groups. So this is primarily a result of different types of oppression like cis sexism, um, and it's caused by a number of factors that contribute to this. So poor social support, uh, socioeconomic status, um, and a primarily prejudice and discrimination. And so this is another manifestation of cis sexism, and trans individuals are often rejected by those who agree with traditional gender ideas, so the idea of uh, uh, binary man and binary woman ideas, and so they face complex trauma on a daily basis. So all of this comes down um, to really one source, um, and that's culture, and that's the culture that we grow up in, um, and we can belong to many different cultures, so we might all belong to American culture, uh, but we might have different faith cultures, uh, we might be members of the LGBT culture, uh, we might have, um, based on our ethnic backgrounds, we might have different cultures because of that. And this could also include family culture, so that the way we're, array, we're raised on that uh, very um, um, interpersonal level. 
so what, what even is culture? Uh, so culture is a shared set of beliefs, uh, values, rituals, and norms that influence all aspects of life. Um, and this is particularly important when we're talking about uh, transphobia and cis sexism, uh, because trans and gender nonconforming individuals often violate cultural norms or perceived values from cultural perspectives about their gender. Um, so in particular, that's in the norms um, section of culture um, and the gender section of culture, but uh, uh, trans and gender nonconforming folks might also be perceived as violating norms in other aspects of culture. So, right, when it comes to language, uh, language hasn't always accommodated for trans individuals, and trans folks have had to literally carve out uh, their own piece in language. And I've heard people complain about this um, and saying that trans folks are making up words or that these genders don't exist. Uh, but just because we don't have a word for something or the word is fairly new or not as well known, it doesn't mean that something doesn't exist, right? We literally create words all the time in the English language, right? 20 years ago, we didn't have expressions like, I'm gonna Google it. Um, hangry didn't exist. Hangry was actually added to the dictionary the same year that agender, which is a non-binary gender, was added to the dictionary. Um, we didn't have words like hipster or bromance or unfriending. So um, language is constantly evolving um, for all of culture and, and all of English. Um, and just because we haven't heard a word before doesn't mean that that word isn't valid and that identity isn't valid. And so within the dominant culture of the United States, there is a narrative around gender that punishes those that don't conform to it. Uh, we have an idea in this country that there are only two genders, even though that's not correct. And we also have specific rules on how we expect the, uh, people from those uh, different genders to act. And so for men, this means that we expect them to be aggressive, independent, strong, dominant, active, not nurturing at all, worldly, decisive, unemotional, uh, intelligent, taking charge, expert, action-orientated, and solvers. For women, we expect them not to be aggressive, but instead to be collaborative, dependent, weak, naive, submissive, passive, nurturing, home-orientated, emotional, uh, and needs uh, protection, and generally unsafe. And even though as a culture we have started to move away from these really harmful stereotypes, they still oftentimes inform the way that people view transgender individuals and have distinct biases around them. It should also be noted that these dominant cultural stereotypes are really based on kind of white colonial culture uh, and white gender roles. And it, it was also expected for indigenous people and other and people of other ethnicities and races to conform should they live within the United States, even if their culture had different ideas regarding this. And so we often talk about this as the gender binary, which is the idea that there are two forms of uh, sex and gender and that they're distinct and completely disconnected. Um, and, and we know that this is inaccurate and is essentially also unfair because throughout our history, we have seen that when things are uh, placed into this binary, um, people that are, that uh, our men um, have more power and privilege, and it's essentially a misogynist system. And again, here's some of the ideas regarding gender stereotypes. And many of these are, uh, are taught to children as they are growing up through the stories that we tell them, through the media that we show, through what they learn in school, without us even necessarily recognizing it. It may even be something that we are saying without, without recognizing it and subconsciously. And the foundations of these gender ideas become, be, begin even before someone is born. So when we have gender reveal parties or when uh, one couple talks about their child and says, oh, you know, my daughter will someday grow up to marry your son or your son will grow up to be president. These are reinforcing these gender stereotypes and these gender roles that we have pre-prescribed in our, in our culture. 
even the way that we talk about reproduction is is something where it is gendered. There's often the mistaken um, idea conveyed to children when they're learning about reproductive health that the sperm are the active one, that they are, are valiantly swimming to reach the egg to, uh, to fertilize, when in fact the egg chooses uh, which sperm is, is able to fertilize. Um, and, and this is often left out of the conversation. And so we can see that this begins early, but how does this narrative continue throughout the lifespan? It continues in the clothing that we buy our children. Um, large companies make clothing that's specifically gendered. And you can see that for the boy on the blue side, uh, that they are the explorer or that they're mommy's little genius. Whereas uh, for the girls, cute comes naturally. Uh, starting this focus uh, that is pervasive for women on their looks or future lady nerd as though uh, she could not be a genius herself but instead a lady nerd which has a somewhat negative connotation. We also see this in the publications that we buy our children. If you look at the boys magazine it's focused on careers because men are expected to uh, take care of families and to have a career. With the girls' ones, it, it again is it's focused on fashion and appearance. And then it follows right into adulthood, with men being told to man up, toughen up, stop crying, not be a virgin, and with women taught to expect that there will be an unequal distribution of privilege and even pay in our society. And this continues as, uh, for men, oftentimes toxic masculinity. And then one of the important things, uh, in particular with the transgender community, is that men are often taught that the worst thing in the world is to be a woman, right? Don't cry, don't be a girl, don't grow like a girl. Um, and this can, um, this can really impact the sexism and transphobia. So trans women can represent this idea of a man who has become a woman, even though that's not true, uh, that person was always a woman. Um, it can represent this to cisgender men um, and can demonize trans women even further. So we also know that um, cis sexism and transphobia creates unique vulnerabilities for trans and gender nonconforming individuals. And then specifically today, we're going to talk about sexual violence. Um, so sexual violence is no different in its definition from um, the cisgender community to the transgender community. Sexual violence um, is um, any sexual act um, that does not have the consent of everyone involved. Um, so this can take many forms and we think of it as this umbrella idea. So it could be unwanted sexual contact. So that could be touching someone or kissing someone without consent. It could be sexual harassment, uh, which can take very many forms. It could be stalking, so stalking can have a sexual violence component to it, so we would consider it sexual violence in some cases. It could be sexual coercion, so pressuring someone or manipulating someone into sex. It could be sexual exploitation, so that's sex trafficking. And it could be rape, so that is penetration of someone's body with someone else's body or an object. And then when it comes to um, the transgender community, uh, one in two transgender people have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. When we break this down further uh, by some of the different identities, um, it's 55% of non-binary individuals have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. 37% of trans women have experienced sexual violence. And 51% of trans men have experienced sexual violence. We also know that many victims are targeted, so regardless of uh, their gender, uh, many victims are targeted. Um, so perpetrators will think about things like accessibility, um, vulnerability, and uh, the lack of credibility to determine who their victim is. Um, and because of this, trans individuals may be more likely to be targeted uh, because they experience many more vulnerabilities. So things like Jason mentioned before, like poverty, homelessness, um, being part of sex work and experiencing violence at younger ages than uh, cisgender individuals. And so because of also because of their identity, they may be less likely to be, be 
to be believed by larger society. So society cannot accept their gender. Um, can they accept when they are victimized? Probably not. And we often know that um, historically the only safe spaces for transgender individuals have been LGBT bars. And alcohol can also really impact the vulnerability um, someone might have and also the lack of credibility someone might have if they're sexually assaulted. We hear that all the time, no matter what someone's gender is. We also know that the root cause of sexual violence is power. So sexual violence is about someone using sex to gain power over another individual. Uh, there may be some elements of sexual attraction, but power is always the primary motivation. And this is why many victims will explain that they felt powerless after they've been sexually assaulted. Uh, for trans individuals specifically, uh, sexual violence may also be tied up in hate crimes. A perpetrator may seek to punish a trans person for violating gender norms by sexually assaulting them. So as I mentioned, um, there are a lot of unique vulnerabilities uh, that transgender uh, folks may face in their life um, that are really going to contribute to this higher risk of sexual violence. And according to the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, um, there are specific vulnerabilities that are true for all LGBTQ folks, including the transgender community. Uh, so some of these might be the intersectional experiences of trauma that transgender folks experience starting in childhood quite often around um, um, rejection of their identity. It can be economic insecurity based on the lack of ability to um, obtain and hold uh, jobs with substantial uh, income. It may be fear of reporting to law enforcement because of the negative interaction between law enforcement and the transgender community, which happens quite often. It could be the consequence of being outed. As we mentioned here in the state of Arizona, there are not those protections, and so people could potentially be fired if they were outed. It could be the lack of culturally specific services, perhaps the sexual violence uh, service doesn't accept transgender people, and of course bias and stigma, which is present in all of these places. And finally, the lack of relationship education, where uh, they are not uh, uh, knowing what are danger signs for uh, unhealthy relationships or other things that could lead to vulnerability around violence. And so we want to make sure that we are offering people options on how to be an ally and stop this cycle of, of violence. It's important to realize that all oppression is connected uh, and that we should all be working as part of the anti-violence movement to stop all forms of oppression. We also want to take particular care um, with greetings, names, and pronouns. So Jason and I already went over the importance of this, uh, but it can also be really good practice to just change the way you start introducing yourself uh, to new people. Um, so at the coalition, uh, we always introduce ourselves with our names and our pronouns because this can indicate that we understand pronouns um, and how, how pronouns work, and it also leaves the space open for another person to tell us their pronouns should they wish it. We also want to make sure that whenever anyone comes to us with a story of sexual violence, that we're present and non-judgmental, that we're not rushing to solve things for them, but instead listening wholeheartedly and, and presently for them as to what they need and what they would like to have happen and what their story is. We also want to make sure um, that if we're cisgender, we are being an active ally to the transgender community. And so being an ally doesn't mean simply saying you support trans folks and the trans community. It means being active in your allyship and using the advantages that you receive as a cisgender person to support trans individuals and to end cis sexism. Um, so how do we really go about doing this? Um, so we know, importantly, that allyship is not an identity and it's not self-defined. Instead, it's a lifelong process. And we, we need to do the work as this people internally to recognize our own privileges and advantages 
And then, so I, I'm cisgender and I will never know what it means um, to be trans and what the trans experience is. But I can educate myself by listening to trans and uh, gender nonconforming individuals talk about their experiences with cis, cis sexism and transphobia. And allyship really means doing this work. So we need to actively acknowledge our privilege and power, and we need to openly discuss them all the time. Uh, we need to recognize that as recipients of privilege, we'll always be capable of being the sexist. We also need to listen more and speak less. We need to hold back our own ideas and opinions, and we need to resist the urge to save people that we seek to work with. We also want to do our work with integrity and with direct communication. Uh, we want to take guidance and direction from trans and gender nonconforming individuals, not the other way around. We also don't want to be expected um, to be educated by others. We want to do our own research uh, on oppression like the sexism. Um, and we also want to keep up with current events. Uh, we want to know about history and what everyday life looks like for trans individuals. We want to build our capacity to receive criticism and to be honest um, so that if we're called out, we recognize that it's not about um, us particularly, but that we need to change our behavior and change the system that we're in. We also want to embrace the emotions that come with allyship. Allyship can be difficult uh, because oftentimes we'll be feeling uncomfortable, but if we don't feel uncomfortable, we probably aren't being a good ally and we're definitely not learning. Uh, being a good ally recognizes that our needs are going to come secondary to the people that we work with, and it's our own responsibility to take care of ourselves. Uh, we also don't want to expect any awards or self, uh, special recognition uh, for being an ally. And we also want to act out of genuine interest in challenging cis sexism. It's really important to talk about allyship in this way, uh, because allyship has been confused with simply supporting um, trans individuals and trans communities. This can be well-meaning, but again, it can recreate the sexism and recreate other forms of oppression. We also want to make sure that we get involved in anti-violence efforts. And part of that is first, as uh, Victoria mentioned, really educating ourselves so that we are a, a proper active ally with it, um, but also getting involved in those anti-violence efforts that we have available to, the, to us. So that could be the anti-gender violence movement. It could be anti-violence um, in, in other more broad ways. But there are plenty of organizations and groups where one can, can uh, seek information and volunteer and participate in anti-violence efforts across the country. Additionally, it's always important to vote. Uh, voting is your voice as to uh, creating the society and culture that you would like to see. And since we know that the root of much of the bias and discrimination that transgender uh, people experience, which adds to the vulnerability around sexual violence, is rooted in culture, we have an opportunity to change it by using our voice in the voting process. We also want to make sure that we are uh, volunteering with LGBTQ organizations. There are many uh, wonderful transgender organizations specifically within Arizona and other more broad LGBTQ organizations that assist with transgender issues across the state. Uh, these include Transqueer Pueblo, GLSEN, HRC, One in Ten, Queer Resource Collective, and the list goes on. If you have trouble finding an LGBTQ or trans-specific organization, you can reach out to us here at the coalition and we're happy to help you. Another thing you can do as an ally is you can educate your friends. Um, so if you're cisgender, you can use your privilege and power as being cisgender to educate other cisgender people. And this can help disrupt the sexism. You want to let your friends know that their transphobic attitudes are not okay and they're not accepted by you. And this also helps keep the burden of education off of trans individuals. You also, uh, we would recommend you recognize that this training is an introduction only that changes in the transgender community happen frequently and is ever evolving uh, and that in order to keep up with the latest information is extremely important. So we would encourage people to take additional training, even if the training is not directly related to sexual assault, 
there may be there are many fine trainings regarding transgender information that can be easily accessed. It's also extremely important that every staff member in the program that you work with has sufficient training to be welcoming, respectful, and affirming of transgender individuals in all parts of your agency, whether they be fellow employees or people seeking services or people in your leadership. Great. And so it looks like we've left plenty of time for questions. Um, so feel free to let us know if you have any questions. You can put them um, in the Q&A or in the chat. One thing I did want to um, draw notice to is in the chat, Michael uh, shared a, a resource of cue cards. And so uh, you may look, look at that resource as something that's helpful on this topic. It does not look like there are any questions right now. So if things do come up later, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is on the screen. And we thank you so much for your attention and your uh, participation today.